SpongeBob SquarePants needs no introduction. He is one of the most recognizable and iconic cartoon characters of all time. He made his first debut on Nickelodeon on July 17th, 1999, and quickly rose to the top of being one of, if not the most recognizable cartoon characters of all time. He plays a significant role in modern day pop culture and many forms of entertainment media, with memes being the character's biggest claim to fame, given how relatable and recognizable the characters and the writing of early SpongeBob episodes are. Needless to say, SpongeBob is everywhere, and the cultural impact he's had on society continues to be prevalent to this very day. Alongside his relevance in pop culture and memes, SpongeBob also starred in a multitude of video games. He would make his first debut in the video game world with the release of SpongeBob SquarePants Legend of the Lost Spatula on the Game Boy Color in 2001. His most popular video game, however, is SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, developed by Heavy Iron Studios in 2003. Battle for Bikini Bottom is praised for its solid platforming gameplay and its attention to the SpongeBob source material as a whole. Fast forward to late 2007, and the SpongeBob special episode known as Atlantis SquarePants is aired on Nickelodeon. Although the episode was met with mixed opinions from critics and viewers alike due to his force and mundane plot, forgettable musical numbers, and general disappointment it caused, it spawned a few video games based around it, with SpongeBob Atlantis Scorpantis by Blitz Games being the most prevalent of the bunch. However, the Atlantis Scorpantis game that we'll be talking about is a PC game entitled SpongeBob's Atlantis Scorpantis Square Off. <laughs> The game was developed by an obscure indie game studio called This Is Pop, and they specialize in making tie-in games for various TV shows, and Spongebob just so happened to be one of those shows. Thus, on January 23rd, 2008, Spongebob Square Off was released. The plot of the game goes as follows. One day, Plankton manages to take over the city of Atlantis and march the way there with black flags in nine different areas to get others to join his unstoppable army so he can eventually take over the world. It is up to Spongebob to stop him by taking those black flags with the help of magical cards. Now, of course, the game doesn't have a groundbreaking plot given the fact that it's about a talking yellow sponge using cards to stop a small creature from taking over the world, but hey, this is a Spongebob game, so that's not a huge shock. Anyways, let's get into the gameplay. The main goal of Spongebob Square Off is to use your cards to navigate to purple tiles that are next to these black flags in each of the game's 54 levels. And upon doing so, you'll beat the level, point A to point B style. As you progress further in the game, the enemies you'll face will be more and more difficult to deal with, as their attacks deal more damage and their health can be on par with yours or even higher than yours. However, if you're looking to speedrun the game, then fighting in this game is completely optional as you can easily beat the game without killing any enemies. But if you're looking to get better cards, then exploring each level is highly recommended. The last level of each world holds a sort of boss enemy you can fight. Bikini Bottom has a buff bluefish guy, Kelp Forest has the Dirty Bubble, Ship Graveyard has the Flying Dutchman, Atlantis Park has David Bowie, I mean the Atlantean King, Atlantis Cliffs has the Queen Jellyfish and the Dirty Bubble again, Atlantis Suburbs has Man Ray, Atlantis Palace technically doesn't have a boss but you're faced with several robot crabs, the Caves has the Dirty Bubble, Man Ray, and the Flying Dutchman, but slightly stronger than before, and last but not least, Plankton's Den has the Dirty Bubble, Man Ray, the Flying Dutchman, and of course, Plankton himself. Let's talk about the four different types of cards you can use. Move cards allow you to move a certain amount of spaces, attack cards allow you to attack enemies or breakable objects in close proximity and vice versa, defense cards allow you to shield yourself from oncoming attacks lowering the damage you take from enemies, and fragile cards are low costing energy cards that deal massive damage to enemies or deal low damage but have incredible range, or they can just be your standard healing cards. They are one time use cards so once you use them you can't use them again, hence why they're called fragile cards. Now while the balancing with all these cards is fine and dandy, fragile cards can be incredibly broken. Don't believe me? Needless to say, you can easily shred through bosses with the use of just two fragile cards. So if you're faced with an annoying enemy or a boss with a lot of health in general, then saving up these fragile cards can be a game changer. You can find them in breakable obstacles if you're lucky, or if you have a lot of coins saved up you can get them from Bubble Buddy's card game. What's Bubble Buddy's card game you may ask? Well, Bubble Buddy's card game is a mini game where you have to keep track of a card you want, as it is shuffled around with other cards. In the green, blue, and purple tents however, there's Plankton's Whammy card, which when picked, you lose your coins and get nothing in return. Well, what do I win? Nothing! 
win! Overall, the only way you can get a whammy card is if you don't focus on a specific card you want, or if you're occupied with Subway Surfers gameplay while playing the game. Anyways, joking aside, let's talk about belts. Mermaid Man's secret utility belt. For 65 years, this belt has helped prevent the fall of nations. And death. As you progress in the game, you'll be able to unlock various different belts that can change the amount of cards you can hold at a time, your health, and your energy. They can be found either by breaking, shaking obstacles, by talking to NPCs like Squidward and Gary the Snail, or for the Kelp Belt by killing the sentient seaweed in each level of the Kelp Forest world. Using these different belts can open doors to new strategies that fit your preference. Honestly, I highly recommend using belts that prioritize energy over health. As long as you play it smart and use maybe one defense card per turn, then getting to the flag should be a cakewalk. The best belt you can get is the iron underwear, hands down. Not only is the balancing for max health and max energy perfect, but it also allows you to hold 20 cards at a time, which makes it ideal for moving, attacking, and then using the rest of your energy for defense. It's definitely the most useful belt in the game. Speaking of defense, one level in each world has a golden jellyfish hidden on the map. Upon killing them, they award you with a yellow sponge defense card. All nine of the yellow sponge defense cards all cost five energy, but they become more powerful depending on what world you found them on. For example, the yellow sponge card you can find in one of the bikini bottom levels only provides five points of defense, while the one that's found in one of the plankton's den levels provides 45 defense. They're honestly really useful, and for the low cost of five energy, they can really save your ass in tight situations. They're well worth collecting, especially the late game ones. So that's the gameplay of this game in a nutshell. Now it's time to talk about the graphics. It's beautiful! Honestly, for a late 2000s game, this game's graphics look really good, and it honestly ages pretty well even for today's standards. The art style is on par with the show, and it makes you feel like you're playing a Spongebob episode. I love all the character sprites and the references to episodes of the show. Not only is Bubble Buddy a character, but characters like Flats the Flounder and Doodle Bob are enemies in this game as well. I don't know, it just really adds to the charm this game has. There's more that I didn't mention, but it's clear that the devs behind this game are fans of Spongebob, and it really shows. And speaking of charm, this game's soundtrack is an absolute bop. Like, listen to this. Seriously though, the music in this game is so damn good. It's hard to believe that a tying game that's incredibly obscure would have music that not only sounds good, but also fits the Spongebob formula nearly to a damn T. My personal favorite is the Atlantis Cliffs theme, which is the song you're hearing in the background right now. Needless to say, they sound exactly like how I would imagine a Spongebob card game would sound. Also, there's a playlist on YouTube containing the entire original soundtrack of this game, but the sound quality isn't that good and there's a lot of popping in each song as well. So I took the liberty to re-upload all the songs in this game, so if you want to listen to the entire soundtrack in HD without any popping, I'll leave a card right now. Okay, I've been kissing this game's ass for a while now. It's time to talk about some of the things I don't like about this game. <laughs> First off, this game has no voice acting. Now, that really isn't surprising given the fact that this game probably didn't have the budget to get Tom Kenny and every other voice actor to voice their characters, but it still sucks nonetheless. I'd rather have it be like other Spongebob games like Battle for Bikini Bottom, where it's text boxes and voice acting, but here it's just text boxes. Second, there's no replay value. For the sake of this video, I 100% completed this game. I beat it all levels, unlocked all the bubble buddy tents, and I got every single belt in the game. And as a result, I got nothing in return. It would have been cool to have a sort of hard mode that would unlock after beating the game, where every level is like 5 times harder than before, similar to Castle Crashers Insane Mode. But again, that's kind of asking a lot from a Nick Arcade game that was made in the late 2000s. And third, a lot of the belts are pretty much useless. The problem with most of the belts is that they prioritize health over energy, and that can lead to the levels dragging on longer and a lot of inconvenient deaths. The Atlantean Guard Belt being a prime example of this. 
It allows you to carry up to only 16 cards, and the max energy you get is a measly 75 energy points. I don't know, maybe they didn't have to add 10 belts to the game. Sometimes less is more in my opinion, and while the amount of belts do add a sort of variety to the game, it won't stop me from exclusively sticking with the iron underwear for every playthrough. But yeah, with that out of the way, here's my final thoughts on the game. The game is actually not that bad. It's good even. And among the other Nick Arcade Spongebob games, this one just so happens to be a hidden gem. The gameplay, while sometimes repetitive, is pretty creative and unique. The graphics and visuals age like fine wine even for today's standards, and the music is just absolutely fire. Despite some of the game's flaws, I'd say it holds up even for today's standards. Now, it's time for a little story about this game when I was younger. When I was a kid, I would always replay the trial version of the game, and I would only make it up to the ship graveyard world because I kept dying in some parts and my family only installed the trial version of the game. So after 58 minutes of playing the game, I would always hear this warning. Warning, you have less than two minutes to play before your free trial ends. Needless to say, that man scared me as a kid, and he still scares me to this very day. Anyways, all joking aside, Spongebob Square Off is good, and if I were to rate this game out of 10, I would give it a 7 out of 10. Not the best game I've played, but not the worst either. And with that, that's all for this video. If you have any childhood memories with this game, please share it in the comments below. I read every single comment that I get. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace out.